part on this conference. So uh, we look forward to have this lecture about women and epilepsy and what um, are the core knowledge that we as frontliners um, need to know. With that, um, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Nina. Uh, hi, morning, everyone. I am Dr. Fong. Thank you for the invitation for me to present this topic. I actually shortened the titles uh, given to me so that I can fit it into my presentation slides. But essentially, today I'm going to talk about um, women and epilepsy, but I'm just going to focus on things that what uh, it's more related to uh, an emergency uh, setting. Right. Oops, see, why is it not moving? Okay. Right, so uh, I'll just talk briefly about status epilepticus and uh, is there any difference in terms of management in women who are pregnant and uh, specifically uh, uh, women. Right, so I think this is definitely not something that you guys are not familiar with. Uh, we are all very uh, used to the definition now that since 2015 uh, that has been revised telling us how do we use the time duration, which we usually use the operational timeline one to decide whether or not to call a patient who had seizures uh, persistently as a status or not a status, right? So uh, if it's a tonic cloning, anything that is five minutes or more than that, that's considered status. Any focal seizures within pet awareness, 10 minutes or more, that's considered status epilepticus. But there are also another group where they have many seizures a day, but they just don't fulfill the criteria that we call them as status. Uh, what is the risk of progressing to status and also uh, what we call them. So we call them as patients who had seizure clusters. We do not have actually a consensus uh, uh, guideline or international standard def standardized definitions on how many seizures in a day, then we would you call that as a seizure cluster. If you look at the literatures of the definitions, there are people who actually define seizure cluster as having three or more seizures in 24 hours. Some say two or more seizures in 24 hours. Some say just two or more seizures in six hours. But essentially, if you look at the tables of the different types of durations and number of seizures that they use, the most commonly used definition is three or more seizures in 24 hours. And these are those that we would want to treat them as status epilepticus because we know about 44% of them, they can progress to convulsive status. Now then, I'm sure you guys know very well about the mortality and the morbidity from status. And uh, as the duration of the seizure goes on, the mechanism, uh, especially at the neurotransmitter levels, uh, and the cellular mechanisms changes that uh, alters the response to, to medic anti-seizure medications at the beginning of the seizure, at the middle of the seizure, and also till the end of the seizure. The longer you wait, the more... The, the more difficult it is for you to control the seizures, therefore the higher uh, mortality. Now, when we talk about women and also in this sort of, in the context of epilepsy, in the context of uh, status epilepticus, do we see a difference in terms of either men have, or, or women has a higher or a lower mortality? There's actually mixed findings in the studies. Some say there is a lower standardized mortality rate in women than in men. Um, but our data itself in Malaysia, we found that there's no gender-specific difference in terms of the standardized mortality rate in terms of stable epilepsy. There's also a controversial of, uh, findings saying that there might be a higher in-hospital mortality for status epilepticus in women, like 11.12% for women compared to 7.4% in men. But that was just a finding from one study. So we can't really conclude whether or not women has either higher or lower risk of dying from status or dying from epilepsy per se. Now, women, the only con the, the concern is always when they become pregnant, all right, and then they have seizures. Worse still, when they go into a state of status epilepticus. Now, there are two sets of conditions. Uh, one are those that they have pre-existing underlying epilepsy, all right, 
and there were some factors that tips them into status epilepticus. Or they can have a new onset status epilepticus in pregnancy among women who had no history of epilepsy, right? So the causes of them would either be a non-pregnancy related things that can happen to any other uh, patients, any other women, uh, regardless of the gender. It can drop into any of the six etiologies, either it's infection, immune mediated. So now we're talking about those autoimmune diseases, all right, autoimmune encephalitis, a structural cause, for example, there is a brain tumor, there is a bleed in the brain, there is a remote infarct, all right, or genetic causes or metabolic causes like hyperglycemia or high urea, or basically just status, but you don't know what's the cause. And whole lots of pregnancy-related complications that can cause status epilepticus, for example, the press or a reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, cerebral venous thrombosis or the eclampsia. Right. Now, so I'll just focus on talking about those women with pre-existing epilepsy because I think the next talk will focus more on those that are uh, new onset status epilepticus and emergency. Right. So what are the risks of having, uh, what is the, 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 the patterns of change in seizure frequency among women with pre-existing epilepsy when they become pregnant? So we basically use the uh, one-third rule. Okay, You either have one-third of the patients with increased seizures, one-third of the patients have decreased in seizures, or one-third of the patients have no change in seizure. But the best predictor for seizure frequency in pregnancy, it's always the seizure frequency in one year prior to pregnancy. If they are already having uncontrolled seizures what the, within that one year prior to the pregnancy, it makes them at higher risk of having seizures or exacerbations of seizures during the pregnancy. Of course, if you have a good one year without seizure, or very good control on medication, then the risk of having seizure frequency during pregnancy, it's very low. So that's why uh, it comes about saying that if your patients who had uh, epilepsy plans to go for pregnancy, or plans for pregnancy will usually want them to, be have, uh, to have a very good seizure control for at least one year so that they don't have an increased seizure during the pregnancy. Now, the factors that can contribute to a change in seizure frequency, it's either uh, things that it's related to anti-seizure medication because of its distribution and metabolism during pregnancy that is due to the hemodynamic changes in a pregnant woman, a non-compliance, mismedication. All right, so the non-compliance or mismedication also sometimes is because there might be a misunderstanding about the side effect of anti-seizure medication to the baby and they will rather not take it uh, because they do not want the anti-seizure medication to affect the, uh, the, the fetus or the baby. Uh, or sometimes when they have this uh, hyperemesis gravidarum during early pregnancy, they may uh, end up not taking the medications because their appetite and the oral intake was just so poor. The other main factors, do not forget, is always the psychosocial adjustments of a woman during pregnancy with all the new stresses, they might be sleep deprived. So even in the context where they are on the right anti-seizure medications, where they are compliant to anti-seizure medication, they can have a change or increase in seizure frequency. Now, why are we so concerned about these patients or women with pre-existing epilepsy on anti-seizure medications having a change in seizure frequency during pregnancy? Every time when the mom has a seizure, especially the convulsive seizures, it carries a risk of not only causing a maternal hypoxia, what is uh, more worrying is also it can cause fetal hypoxia. And during the time when this happens, the fetal heart rate decelerates and it therefore increases the risk of premature uh, labor delivery. It also increases the risk of stillbirth and also fetal death. Right, so we'll just go into the most uh, important thing that may actually affect how the seizure change in pregnancy. It depends on what the anti-seizure medication the patient uh, is on prior to pregnancy. Uh, not all can fluctuate. There are only a few that the levels fluctuate remarkably during pregnancy. The one in the chart, in the group bar chart, actually showed uh, three most important anti-seizure medication, which is lamotrigine. Oxcarbazepine and also uh, levetiracetam. 
All right. So if the medicate the you have a epilepsy uh woman with epilepsy on these three medication comes in during uh, uh when they are pregnant and they came in with these uh, uh seizure clusters or status or breakthrough seizures, always look back at the type of medication they are on. Are they on these medications? They are not adjusted appropriately in pregnancy and therefore they get a breakthrough seizures. Now, this is basically uh, the Monet uh, study group, right? So just not too long ago in 2022, just to show you how the uh, drug concentration can change in different trimesters during uh, pregnancy and also during the postpartum period. So on the uh, graph A here, it is for lamotrigine. So what you can see is this in the box plot and also the uh, median bar here. You can see actually starting from second to third trimester, there is a drop in the concentrations of the lamotrigine and the drop can be as much as up to 56.1% during the whole pregnancy. And once they deliver, you can see the drug concentration goes up again. Now, similarly goes with the uh, similar observations seen in Labitiracetam, that you see there is a drop in the drug concentration in second and third trimester, and it increases up back in postpartum period. But of course, then the degree of drop in concentration is not that great as compared to lamotrigine. Here, we quoted as 36, a reduction in 36.8% of the concentration during pregnancy. Now, now because we tend to encounter patients who have all sorts of new anti-seizure medications, for example, zonisamide, lacosamide, topiramate, so are those medications, will uh, do they actually behave like lamotrigine and uh, levetiracetam during pregnancy? So what you can see is that the uh, level pretty much remains quite stable throughout the pregnancy. They do have reduction. We expect them to fluctuate, which is normal, but the level is actually not as significant as lamotrigine. So if you do encounter a patient, or we do see as a neurologist, a patient who are on lamotrigine in pregnancy, we always, always want to see them at least once or twice uh, towards the end of first trimester so that we can do something in those adjustment. So this is a table that shows you on the first row, all right, the expected drop in lamotrigine concentration starts in second trimester it can be more than 65% from the baseline. And in postpartum, usually it will go back to the pre-pregnancy level within one to two weeks, sometimes even a few days. Usually by the second week postpartum, the lamotrigine levels will go back to the pre-pregnancy level. Now by right, what everybody is doing in your inner center or a facility where you can check the lamotrigine concentration, do a TDM. So they will usually do it every four weeks and it's very guided. The adjustment of the lamotrigine dose is very guided by the TDM or therapeutic drug levels of lamotrigine. All right. And postpartum as well, you take the uh, take the uh, TDM again and um, you reduce it back to the pre-pregnancy dose once the patient is, uh, the reference concentration falls back to about 20-25% of the uh, the, during the pregnancy level. But we don't have the luxury of doing that. So what we do is usually in the first trimester, we don't do anything. Let me just highlight this thing. We don't change the lamotrigine. What we do is at the end of first trimester, we'll preemptively increase the lamotrigine dose 50% of the baseline. So for example, if you have a patient uh, who's on lamotrigine about 50 milligram uh, twice a day, means the daily dose is 100 so you increase the total daily dose by 50% means you're going to increase it from 50 milligram twice a day to 75 milligram twice a day. And of course, whether or not you need further adjustment depends on whether the patients would have things like breakthrough seizures without any triggering factor that it might be an indication that you need to further increase the medication. And then from second week postpartum onwards, we will reduce the lamotrigine uh, to the pre-pregnancy level. So this is what we do here. Right, so if you do encounter a patient where pre-existing epilepsy comes in with status, comes in with seizure clusters, comes in with breakthrough seizures, as usual, we'll screen for the acute febrile illness, take all the histories, whether it's suggestive of non-compliance, missed medications, and really look into the patient's anti-seizure medications. Are they on lamotrigine? Are they on levetiracetam? Now, at the moment, we do not usually readjust uh, levetiracetam dose 
like how we do for lamotrigine, although we know that the drop in concentrations in second trimester could be quite remarkable. What we do is usually we go by clinical uh, judgment. If they have or increase in seizure frequency, then you might need to increase the labetiracetam. If you want, you can. I think certain centers in Malaysia, they do offer laritiracetam therapeutic drug level. But again, cost is always an issue. The turnaround time for the results to come back is always an issue. Okay? Even if you take the therapeutic drug level, you usually, in concerns of the patient's seizure control, you usually just increase the medications if you think uh, needed. Right? So I'm going to talk about this one. Right. So... When we deal with status epilepticus in women, are there any difference in the groups? Like, you know, if you're dealing with women and other genders, when dealing with pregnant women and non-pregnant women, are there any difference? The question is always, we are all very concerned about the side effects of anti-seizure medication uh, to the woman and which can be, you know, passed down to, which can affect the uh, fetus or the baby. Now, uh, this is a chart showing you a comparison of major congenital malformation across and different anti seizure medications in different registries. So we have the UK and Irish, the European and the North America one. So what stands out is at the far end of this group, which is Valparate, which has the highest prevalence of major congenital malformation, that is more than 10%. So the one that gets flex is always the Valparate. All right, when we talk about major congenital malformation, so what are we con what, are, what what sort of congenital malformation that is of our concern? All right, so this is a table just showing what are those congenital malformations that can occur in an offspring born to a mother who takes Valparate during pregnancy. So spina bifida is top on the list. You can have also have other cardiac congenital malformations like atrial septal defect, cleft palate, hypospadias, polydactyly, and cranial synotosis, right? So all these are things that we do not want in a baby born to a mother taking anti-seizure medication. So, and it's also one of the anti-seizure medications. When we talk about major congenital malformation, it is dose-dependent, meaning the higher the dose, the greater the risk of major congenital malformation. The higher the dose, there's also a higher risk of the baby born, uh, has low IQ, has got an increased risk of getting autistic spectrum uh, disorder, right? So here what is showing you are the data from the European uh, Registry of uh, Anti-Seizure Medication Use in Pregnancy. So basically this is compared to Levitiracetam. You have Valparate here, the risk or the prevalence of major malformation, it's lower if you're using any dose of six, uh, 650 milligram per day compared to using a moderate 650 to 1,450 milligram per day and dose which is on extremely high, uh, uh, high dose, all right? Now, so this is uh, fresh from the hour, I think about two weeks ago from JAMA. So basically just show you the dose uh, dependent effect among all anti-seizure medications, Valprate is the one that significant has got the trend that shows you the higher the dose, the more or the higher the risk of getting major congenital malformation. Not to forget, when we always talk about Valparate, we are also concerned about other anti-seizure medication, for example, phenobarbiton and also phenytoin. So phenobarbiton, the congenital malformation risk goes up to about 10 to 8. Phenytoin is about 6.3%. But the, these two anti-seizure medication the effect is not dose dependent, right? So just showing you with a different color range, showing different types of congenital malformation. And again, if you see the Valprate is on the far end with a higher risk of congenital malformation, it can cause any forms of congenital malformations from cardiac to neuro to kidney, all right, to combinations of everything. And because of that, because of the knowledge of the side effects of uh, anti-seizure medications among pregnant women. So this is the trend that they see, all right, in change in prescriptions or usage of anti-seizure medications among pregnant women over the years. So the one that is of green color, yellow, uh, uh, blue colors are phenytoin and valparate. 
Okay, so over the years from 1998 until 2021, you can see there is a progressive reduction in the use of anti-seizure medications of phenytoin, valproate, and also carbamazepine. And you see there is always a stable increase in lamotrigine. Okay, and in 2011, when the FDA starts warning about valproate use in child women with childbearing potential, we start seeing an increase in the levetiracetam use, which is the one, the bar in the, sorry, the area uh, in the chart in orange. And in 2015, it's when we see a uh, substantial increase in prescription of anti seizure medication of uh, levetiracetam among pregnant women. So this is a craft that we usually use even until now when we're sitting in clinic uh, dealing with women with childbearing potential. We want the medications that, of course, do not cause uh, or has the lowest risk of major congenital malformation. But at the same time, we do not want them to have seizure uh, during the pregnancy. So what we go is that we go to the, we will choose the medications towards the left far left of this chart with the lowest risk of malformation and below the line which is lower below the linear line here which has got a lower risk of uh, seizures or breakthrough seizures during pregnancy so our favorite drug nows are lamotrigines and levetiracetam desperations you can give things like uh, topiramate as well so knowing all these major congenital malformations, con uh, side effects in uh, pregnant women, or sorry, women with childbearing potential, do they change how clinicians treat uh, status epilepticus in pregnancy? Now, this is a survey done in the US. So those reported their management on status epilepticus, it's actually uh, different. Their approach is different uh, when they're dealing with pregnant versus non-pregnant patients. They tend to have a preference to choose over levetiracetam and also lacosamide in patients who had refractory status epilepticus and they tend not to choose obelparate or phenobab. Now, the realistic is that can you really use Valparate in women who comes in with status epilepticus? Answer is, if you read the line in the FDA warning for Valparate use, okay, I'm just going to blow up this paragraph. It says, healthcare professional should inform women of childbearing potential about the risk okay, of all the major uh, congenital malformation and consider alternative treatment, especially if using Valparate to treat migraine or other conditions that are not usually considered life-threatening, all right? Now, status epilepticus is a life-threatening condition, right? If you don't treat them, the seizure won't stop. You have a very high mortality, even morbidity risk, even if the patient survives. Now, in the context, if you're dealing with seizure clusters, if you're dealing with status epilepticus, it is not a contraindication to not uh, it is not a contraindication to use uh, valparate in women, in pregnant women, or in early pregnancy. Okay, so not contraindication. So the answer is there is no difference in terms of management. And I'm very sure you are very familiar with all these uh, guidelines that came out with the NT, uh, in the American Epilepsy Society, what you're supposed to do at zero to five minutes at the initial treatment phase. And even in the guideline, they, there is no uh, gender-specific management as in, oh, if you're a woman, if you're pregnant, then the choices of drugs would be different. So benzodiazepine is always the initial first line, right? And we always wanted to push advocate the use of midazolam, all right, because of the advantage to be able to serve it in intramuscular uh, administration mode that actually gives you a rapid sort of a shorten the time uh, to you to give the medication, therefore uh, increases uh, the chance of a seizure termination uh, early in the uh, seizure clusters, right? And it's as effective as other uh, benzodiazepines. In this case, it's compared to the IV lorazepam. All right, it's shortened the time for faster onset because of its mode of administration, right? And second line, basically, there is no evidence to even prefer a sec which one is better. Is it phenytoin better? Valbrate acid is better? Levitiracetam uh, is better? I think uh, nowadays, there's also a lot of people in the specialty where you can 
have things like intravenous lacosamide. It is also one of the medication of choice, but there are no difference in terms of efficacy of these medications. If you are giving them at the right dose, in 2011, we used to thought that 222 rule actually works in the form of, you know, 20 mg for phenytoin, 20 mg per kilogram for valprate, 20 mg per kilogram for laritiracetam, gives you a favorable success rate in controlling the seizure. But now in 2019, we know that we need to use the 246 rule, all right, which is 20 mg per kilogram for phosphenitoin. We don't have phosphenitoin here, we have phenytoin. 40 mg per kilogram for valparate and 60 mg per kilogram for laritiracetam for uh, consistent seizure control, right? And anything beyond that, there is no clear evidence. You can use your anesthetic agents as whatever that's available in your state. Uh, in your setting and again using propofol using thiopenton phenobarbital ketamine in cases sorry phenobarbital especially in cases where you have pregnant women or even women with childbearing potential is not an issue because the primary aim is always to stop the seizures in the mother first all right then you think of what you want to do with the fetus right so when we manage seizure cluster it is exactly the same when we're trying to abort the seizures before you go into a cycles of uh, cluster of seizures. So this article basically is trying to sell uh, the uh, usage of what we call as the REST regime, the rapid epileptic uh, seizure termination, where if you know the, the patients is a type high risk of going to seizure cluster, especially those with things like lenogesto, some epileptic encephalopathy, all right, then you probably want to just give benzodiazepine even if their seizure has aborted just one episode because you know they are going to go into seizure cluster after that and potentially go into status epilepticus. Now, just want to talk about magnesium sulfate. We know that uh, ONG, probably you guys use in patients who had eclampsia, and there are these trials that shows that it can effectively reduce the risk of recurrent seizures in a clumptic woman. Uh, and it's the reduction uh, rate is actually quite remarkable if we compare to diazepam or phenytoin. All right. So does it work in patients who are non eclamptic but it's also in status epilepticus? There's actually a mixed finding. So we're just a 50% patients actually shows a response in terms of seizure reduction after magnesium sulfate in non eclamptic cases. So the conclusion is if you think or you're not sure at the moment whether your patient is seizing because of eclampsia, it in doubt you can actually give magnesium sulfate, right? I think this is my uh, last slide, which is a usage of anti-seizure medications among breastfeeding women. All right, can you give them the same anti-seizure medication as what you give to those who are not breastfeeding? Answer is yes. We always encourage our pregnant mothers, uh, even during pregnancy, when they come for follow-up in our clinic, we'll just ask them, are you planning to breastfeeding? Please do so. All right. If there's any concern about anti seizure medication, we'll always reassure them that the infant, uh, sorry, the medication, anti seizure medication concentration excreted, excreted, no, sorry, secreted, in the breast milk, it's extremely, extremely low and it's safe for most medication except for things like phenobarbiton, all right, because of its long acting, because of higher concentrations that you actually find in breast milk. Other than that, anyone who's on any types of anti seizure medication uh, should be encouraged to breastfeed to their baby, right? And the same thing is if they come in with seizures, do not hesitate to use exactly the same regime that you use for those who are not breastfeeding. I think that's my end of the talk. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sam, so much, uh, Celia, for your um very um very interesting talk. I suppose I first heard this when I joined one of your colleagues' uh, talk, uh, Dr. Sharini. I suppose, uh, and I think that um. This is something that, uh, you know, the unique part about emergency department is we don't see only red zone cases in which the status epilepticus will come in, right? Mm. But we also see the green zone cases as well as the yellow zone cases in which these people 
they are sometimes most of them come because they are not compliant with medication and mm. they are they plan to get pregnant that's the interesting part and they do not know what they are doing they are not taking the medication they are not going for their follow up and they keep on coming to the hospital because they thought that you know nothing is wrong with me i'm just going to go on with my life like this and i'm going to bear the baby so yeah these are the things that uh, i think uh, more challenging if they uh, we have uh, mo's or um, doctors working in a district hospital because they may not know that um, like whatever you mentioned earlier, like starting sodium valproate, of course, in GTC, uh, we want to have sodium valproate uh, started for the patient as first line. But um, if the patient is planning to get pregnant, for example, then probably uh, they want to consider uh, the batracetam, right? Yeah, mm. so um, I would like to open um, the floor um, for any question um, to be directed to Dr. Fong Sile. You can type it inside the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and ask her directly. Okay, maybe I just add about the the the, the scenarios that you mentioned just now. Mm -hmm. That uh starting anesthesia medications in women who have childbearing potential. Mm. I think at this point of time. Still, not all hospitals, especially districts, have even lamotrigin, mm -hmm. let alone levetiracetam. All right, and uh, sodium valproate is just the medic, the only medications that you can think yeah. of, uh, to give the patient right in desperate conditions like that. Then you may want to just use valproate, but you counsel the patients beforehand and document that. Uh, and make sure that uh, they are referred if you really think that the chances of you going to increase the valprate dose to uh, 400 milligram twice a day or more, which is the usual case, they may need to see a specialist uh, in the center which can offer them other anti-seizure medication, right? Uh, otherwise, I mean, yeah, otherwise it would be very difficult if it comes to, I mean, later on, if the baby is really born with some defects or low IQ or autistic, then it would be, yeah, sort of a medical legal thing, yeah. Mm, yeah, I think that is a very um, a great advice because um, a lot of people, um, they may not have um levetiracetam like you mentioned, and they just started a patient without thinking of when this patient actually should be referred to the tertiary hospital, perhaps, uh, to get neurologist or physician uh external inform uh, external input so that this patient can be managed well. And <clears throat> um also important that um I think uh, for those who are working in the green zone uh, or even emergency physician, probably when you are doing your rounds in the observation bay, this patient can be discharged. If this patient is planning to get pregnant or during early pregnancy and the seizure is not controlled, then it's best to get neurologists to see this patient because some of them um, may be under only KK follow-up. <laughs> So I've seen few patients uh, um, coming to my hospital uh, and first trimester pregnancy uh, on uh, two types of uh, anti-seizure medication not being referred to uh, neurologist because uh, it is not easy, right, to manage a pregnancy. Uh, I mean, women with pregnancy and on top of that having epilepsy as well. So it's pretty challenging. Um, I have one question for you, um, like uh, starting the anti-epileptic drugs, I mean, in a, in in your setting, for example, where you have all the resources, which one would be your first choice, uh, whether it would be a lamotrigine or levotiracetam? You mean women with childbearing? Uh, yeah. Oh. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> the challenge, I have the medication. Yes, you are right that we have the resources but it requires the patient to pay for the medication. Oh, okay. Now, great, they don't need to pay. So they need to pay for lamotrigine and levetiracetam. Mm. Uh, so the scenario then becomes if they are those with things like what we call as idiopathic generalized epilepsy, or nowadays we call them genetic generalized epilepsy, your juvenile absence, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, you know they will respond very well to sodium valproate. Mm -hmm. Right, 
I will still give them sodium valproate and tell them about the risk factors. Okay, one day if you're planning to get married, you're planning to get pregnant, let us know and then we switch during that time. And before you plan, you maybe one year before you plan to get pregnant. Mm. And then if the seizure uh, 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 becomes controlled with lamotrigine and whatnot and they want to continue with that, that's fine. Right. But I will still choose Valprate in those cases. But if it's in things like focal epilepsy, all right, I might want to just start off with things like Leviteracetam. Uh, and if it doesn't work, it's child uh, bearing uh, potential. And then I will probably either add on a Lamotrigine. But anyway, if it doesn't work, they shouldn't be pregnant in the first place. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's very interesting, very much interesting. Okay, um, before we move to the next speaker, uh, anyone else want to ask, um, um, maybe share with Dr. Sile about your difficulties in handling women with um, pregnancy who come in with seizure? Because I guess when, when, you, when somebody is pregnant um, and you can see the belly uh, protruding out and the patient develops seizure, you always activate the red alert. So when red alert, comes in, the ONG team will be there. So it is always eclampsia until proven otherwise. Yes. So that is that is some the, the thing that sometimes uh things might be missed. Like you mentioned, there are a few other differential diagnoses. It's not eclampsia all the way. Like it's only one diagnosis available. There we have many more other diagnoses, right? So I guess um in the midst of that chaotic environment, always bear in mind that history is also very important, whether the patient has headache, my suggest patient might have like sinus thrombosis or maybe infection. We have had, uh, when I worked in um, Sabah last time, a patient come in with um, mycotic aneurysmal rupture secondary to meningitis because he had an internal ear, um, inner ear infection. So that, that kind of things actually can contribute to seizure and the treatment might differ because it is not always eclampsia. So I think that is a very um, um, important thing that should be considered at the back of our head when we're handling patient with um, who is pregnant and, and also uh, coming with seizure. Okay, um, so if there is uh, no question uh, to be asked to Dr. Fon Sile, um, thank you so much Sile for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I think uh, this is one of my favorite topic, actually, honestly. So that's why I call you up because I don't think so. I I have the ability to give uh, such a very wonderful lecture. So uh, um, we hope to see you and thank you for contributing for today's event. All right. Okay. All right. I'll make All right. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm gonna bye. Okay. I'm gonna stop recording.